Do we need to introduce Becky again? Ugh. For like the fourth time. Yeah, this is I'm... Becky. She does all the stuff. <laughs> Yay, stuff. <laughs> I'm just realizing how disappointed I am in us that we never made like a little short theme song intro musical number to play at the beginning of each one. You, you realize I didn't make one. Uh, I have one where, where we have a whole bunch of preparators and stuff who are like busy working and then they turn and smile at the camera and I've got I've got like cuts of everybody of all of our preparators and volunteers doing this. It's amazing. Uh, well that sounds like it's needed for Thursday. <laughs> Welcome to another Chatting with NDGS Paleo. My name is Becky, Becky Barnes and I am a paleontologist with the North Dakota Geological Survey. So uh, a little bit off the cuff here, but uh, a while ago I had been asked to do a presentation for a continued education class, and they were interested in some of the history of paleontology. And not just the fossils, but the people that were involved with getting the field of paleontology started. So uh, now there are many, many, many more people in the realm of paleontology than I could ever have time to, to chat about. But, but these are some of the, the ones that really, really stuck out to me. I've got um, what we knew, what we knew, like we knew before these people, and then what we discovered with them. So paleontology, as it is today, took hundreds of years of study to get to where we are. And I'm not, I'm not talking about all of human history where we're discovering fossils and, and creating stories of dragons and griffins and things. I'm, I'm talking about the actual study of paleontology where they're trying to figure out what these bones are and where they came from. And it's not a popularity contest, although sometimes it seems like it is. <laughs> um, and in the world today, if only if people only listen to the cool or the popular, then the earth would still be flat. Oceans would empty into a vast space. Insects would spontaneously generate from rotten meat. They would just appear magically. And here are here, these are just some of the stories of some of the people who are not cool, who are quite varied in their history and how they helped. So we have Robert Hooke, who was born in 1635. And before Robert Hooke, we knew that fossils grew underground and that the rocks just kind of looked like living things, just a happenstance. They, they weren't real, they were just funny looking rocks uh, that just happened to, to look like modern, modern things. And then he took a look using microscopes at fossils and living things up close because you have to study living things in order to understand fossil things. And he argued that, no, no, these are, these are actual bones and, and chunks of wood and shells and things that have turned to rock. And he's trying to justify and I said, how in the world could you have one thing get turned into another thing? And so he, he hypothesized that uh, the wooden shells and whatnot were soaked with mineral-laden wa water for who knows how long, uh, turning them into rock. That's pretty close, really. And so he argued that these things that were in the ground were not just funny-looking rocks, but were real evidence of things from our history. Kind of cool. Georges Cuvier, who is, I believe, Jeff's personal hero, <laughs> Before Cuvier, um, there was no field of paleontology. There was, there was no field associated uh, for studying these particular fossil creatures. And we knew that all the animals that were alive today had always been alive. Nothing went extinct. There was nothing ever new. Everything stayed the same. So he helped establish the field of paleontology and really, really helped further the field of comparative anatomy. So that's taking one thing, looking at it, say like the tooth of one creature and then studying the tooth of another creature and how are they similar, how are they different? So he did a lot of comparisons. And he is, uh, he, he has a phrase associated with him, which is show me your teeth and I'll tell you who you are. So looking at parts and pieces of creatures and animals, uh, fish and, and reptiles and 
looking at all the differences and similarities to see what in the world is, is going on. So with all of these fossils that are now popping up um, is in the, the 1700s, he suggested that Earth was dominated by reptiles at some point in ancient times. And he also said that, no, no, extinction does happen because he had these, these teeth, these mastodon and mammoth teeth. And looking at these giant teeth, you know, the world is still kind of undiscovered at this point in time. And, and so people are like, oh yes, these great giant elephantine creatures are certainly off in the Americas, or they're, they're, they're you know, undiscovered in some deep dark forest somewhere. And after a while, you get explorers that are going about, you know, bring me your parts and pieces, tell me what you've seen. And nobody ever saw a mammoth or a mastodon. <laughs> So he pretty much verified that no extinction does indeed happen. William Buckland. Before him, there were no known dinosaurs. No, no like actual dinosaur fossils had been named. Uh, things had been found, but nothing had ever been described as like, yeah, this is a dinosaur. Uh, we didn't have even the word for dinosaur. And he described our first carnivorous critter named Megalosaurus. And he also uh, joined up with a, another paleontologist, which I'll get to, and described fossil feces or coprolites and how they could be used to reconstruct what was available in that environment to be eaten. He agreed with another scientist, Louis Agassi, that glaciers, these big giant mountains of ice, bulldozed and shaped and molded a lot of the northern continents and dropped rocks and fossils along the way. Gideon and Mary Mantell, both of this couple were involved with discovering and naming creatures. Um, the, the story is that Mary found the teeth and then Gideon described the teeth. Uh, who, who's to actually know? But they described some of the first plant-eating dinosaurs, so Iguanodon and Hylosaurus. And you notice that the little creature that Gideon is carrying has a little horn on its nose. And that was actually the thumb spike of our iguanodon friend. Uh, but they didn't quite know how the pieces went together, so they just kind of stuck the, stuck the thumb spike on the end of the nose. And they became, in their own right, experts on prehistoric reptiles. Now, Mary Anning is definitely a personal hero of mine, heroine of mine. And before Mary Anning, most fossils that were discovered, any of the shells or like ammonites or uh, random coprolites and things were curios. They were interesting looking rocks, cool, good to be stuck in a cabinet labeled with fancy terms. Uh, for instance, an ammonite, which is a coiled shell that went round and round and round. They were called snake stones, but kind of like a snake coiled up. Um, and there was no she, she had no, no formal education in paleontology because they didn't allow women to be paleontologists. She was not allowed to join the, the geological societies because she was a woman. So she decided that she was just gonna do her own thing. And there's lots and lots of books on Mary Anning. She's really fun to read about, but she, she also ended up having to copy down all kinds of manuscripts and papers because there was no such thing as a photocopier at this point in time. Uh, that was called a pencil and paper or pen and paper. And so she, she ended up borrowing these scientific journals and scientific publications and then hand writing copies for herself so that she could increase her library. She helped identify coprolites for what they were. Uh, she found them in the body cavities of these ichthyosaurs and animals and went, yeah, I don't think these are just funny looking rocks. I think this is boo. She's known for finding the first complete plesiosaur, uh, our first British pterosaurs, uh, Dimorphodon, who is one of my favorites, the ichthyosaurus, and she gained a lot of respect. Now, the, she was respected for what she was able to do, but not on paper. So people always came to her and they picked her brain and they bought her specimens and they, they were like, oh, these are fantastic. We can write all the stuff about them. But when it was time for the papers and it was time for acknowledgements, not so much. So she was, she was kind of swept under the rug because she was a woman. Now, however, she's definitely listed as one of the top 10 British women who have influenced science and definitely paleontology. 
So she is, she is a big, big hero of mine. Again, lots of books. Stone Girl, Bone Girl is a very charming little book about Mary Anning. Uh, Girls Who Looked Under Rocks, Mary Anning and the Sea Dragons, uh, all, all kinds of, of books, and many, many more than what I just have on here. There's lots and lots of books out on, on Mary Anning. Sir Richard Owen. Ah, so before Sir Richard Owen, we had no word to describe these giant extinct reptiles. We didn't have the word dinosaur. So he coined the term dinosauria, terrible reptile, in order to lump together all of these creatures that people had been describing. Okay, they're big reptiles, but what are they? Oh, well, these are dinosaurs. Okay, now we have a word. So he, he coined the word dinosauria and thus was able to lump, lump the megalosaurus and the guanodon and the hylosaurus and all the following critters into that category. Now, he is very, very well known for establishing the Natural History Museum of London. Not only that, but he also made the museum accessible to the public. And this is a very important thing for you and me. So this doesn't mean that you are hoity-toity, the creme de la creme. You, you are not the top of society and only invited in to go see these museums. No, you can pay admission and go in or like the Heritage Center, you can just go right on in. You don't have to pay an admission. So he's the one who, who established this mentality of making this knowledge accessible to everybody in order to better everybody. He's also known for being grumpy. Now, a lot of you may know Edward Drinker Cope and Othniel Charles Marsh through the Bone Wars. Now, before these two, we had very few dinosaurs. You know, you had the Megalosaurus, you had Iguanodon, but we didn't have a lot. Like nowadays, there are hundreds of dinosaurs, and any 10-year-old out there can probably rattle off all of them. But with these two vying for fame and fortune, glory, um, they started off as friends, became enemies, uh, because they kept... <sighs> backstabbing each other essentially. There's lots of books on these two as well uh, where they were each trying to write the most papers. They were each trying to name the most creatures. They each had their own mistakes which the others never forgave them for. <laughs> heads on the wrong ends of animals, completely wrong heads stuck on the bodies of other animals. Uh, so there were there were some mix-ups in the rush to get everything printed and published and on display in museums, but their contributions to the field of paleontology were huge. Lots and lots of creatures named, many, many papers named. Uh, we, have, we have things here in North Dakota that were named uh, by Edward Drinker Cope. So for North Dakota even, uh, he's a, a very important paleontology. And so they, with, with this big fight between the two. Of course, you know, newspapers pick it up because it's juicy information. And so you're having these battles between paleontologists. It kind of helped bring paleontology into the public awareness. Now, paleontology wasn't just some dusty science left to a museum. Um, there, there was some intrigue going on here. Hmm. Lots and lots of books on these two. More, again, way more than, than I have uh, up on here. Harry Seeley, uh, I never really hear too terribly much about Harry Seeley, but he's very important. Um, before his work, everybody divided up dinosaurs and prehistoric reptiles using body features like, how big is it? How long is it? What does a tooth look like? Uh, the, what, what do the feet look like? And they weren't really looking at lineages of creatures. They were just looking at this one's big with pointy teeth. That one's big with pointy teeth too. They should be related, even if they weren't necessarily related. And he, and also previous to this, uh, thought that dinosaurs and, and pterosaurs were these cold-blooded, sluggish creatures. But after his work, he started really looking at the anatomy of, of some of these creatures and thought that dinosaurs and pterosaurs were indeed warm-blooded and active. And he looked at their skeletons and how the bones were fitting together and argued with Sir Richard Owen. I mean, these, these people uh, argued with each other all the time. And, and those arguments are, are what help further science. Uh, hopefully polite arguments, but uh, some letters that get written back and forth that you can, you can look up uh, 
get rather heated. <laughs> so he believed that pterosaurs and birds had a common ancestor in the archosaurs. So birds being er, dinosaurs, but hadn't quite worked that out yet. And he is the one who divided dinosaurs into their two big categories of lizard hip, the saurischians, and bird hipped or ornithischians. But it was a little bit backwards as far as now is concerned because our birds actually came from the lizard hip dinosaurs, not the ornithischian bird hip dinosaurs. So it just added some complication in there, but it's, it's too late to fix it now. Barnum Brown. Barnum Brown is a big name in paleontology. And he is the discoverer, not the namer, but the discoverer of Tyrannosaurus rex. Uh, it was named by Henry Fairfield Osborne. Uh, he also curated, uh, it was a curator for the American Museum of Natural History in New York for many, many years. Uh, I have him drawn here wearing a fur coat because he's infamous for heading out into the field with bowler hat, fancy hat, and uh, beaver skin or beaver fur cloaks and whatnot. Uh, he said he's fancy. I, I don't know. It was, it was just his style. He thought it was kind of fun. And he's also known for collecting creatures from many different states as well as many different countries. Not so good was his use of dynamite, TNT, to excavate fossils. So, oh, there's a big rock in the way or a hillside in the way, set some charges, kaboom, go, up, go back and pick up the pieces. Uh, some days, some days. I wish this would still happen, <laughs> but maybe, maybe not the, the best methods for, for collecting fossils. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Diplodocus or the, the long-necked sauropod, the green emblem for Sinclair oil. He's the one who helped come up with that symbol in order to uh, come up with funding for his digs. And he also provided input for Disney's Fantasia, the dinosaur scene. So he's, he's got information all over the place. And there's lots of really good books on Barnum Brown as well. Roy Chapman Andrews. So lots have been found in, in uh, Europe, lots have been found in the United States, not so much had been found from Mongolia. It was kind of an, an unknown section of territory. And so he was one of the first explorers for Mongolia for figuring out what kind of creatures were there. So like Oviraptor and Velociraptor and Protoceratops, all of these creatures, as well as some of the first dinosaur eggs that were collected there, way over in the Gobi Desert. Um, uh, he's probably one of Jeff's heroes because Je Je Jeff is a fan of Paraceratherium, which is the largest land mammal ever. <laughs> very, very huge creature. So he discovered Paraceratherium, uh, as well as Andrew Sarkis. And he's thought to be the inspiration for Indiana Jones. He, as, as per his, his picture that I drew on here, he's got his hat, he's got his gun belt, he's got his, his, his boots and everything, and he was an adventurer, like full-blown Indiana Jones adventurer. So, uh, was he the inspiration? Maybe, maybe not. It's kind of fun, though. Lots and lots of books with him as well. Luis Alvarez. Um, before him, we were unsure how the dinosaurs went extinct. We know that they went extinct. We don't have dinosaurs wandering around except for, you know, birds, but we didn't know how. And he found a layer of clay between Cretaceous rocks and the tertiary. And uh, so tertiary now it gets this, this term called paleogene. So it used to be the KT boundary. And so now it's the KPG boundary, so paleogene. So uh, a little difference there. Uh, and he suggested that it was some kind of an extraterrestrial event. So a comet or an asteroid or something that slammed into the world, into Earth somewhere and ended all the dinosaurs. Uh, the Chicxulub crater was later discovered in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico and kind of lent some, some weight to this theory. Oh, uh, her name is always a, a tongue twister for me. I'm sorry, Jeff can pronounce this name really well. I can't. <laughs> Zofia uh, Kielan-Jowarowska. I'm sorry. Um, 
she ha she was great because she was another female paleontologist. So uh, Little Paleontology was across international borders, but she was she was the first woman to serve in the International Union of Geological Sciences. And she also worked with the Gobi Desert and discovered a whole bunch of new crocodiles and turtles and lizards. And she also found these really, really cool arms, very large arms with very long claws, just scary looking claws. And they called it Dinocaris, which is uh, one of the largest ornithomimosaurs. And uh, kind of interesting because you would think that these big, long, sharp looking claws would be part of some giant theropod dinosaur and it's got a weird duck head. You, you, can, you can look up Dinocaris now and, and they have very, very odd heads. Uh, John Ostrom and Robert Bakker. Uh, before these two again, dinosaurs were still cold-blooded, they were sluggish reptiles that couldn't move very fast, and they took closer looks at the skeletons of these animals and said, no, these were active, warm-blooded creatures that looked surprisingly similar to birds and some of the theropods. And they were finding these fossils in climates or areas that would have been too cold for cold-blooded creatures. Like even, even back when the weather was warmer, you still had areas that would have been too cold and would have been inhospitable for cold-blooded like crocodiles or turtles. And so you're not finding a lot of creatures like that there, but you're still finding dinosaurs there. And so in order to do that, you would have to have some kind of endothermy. You would have to be some kind of a warm-blooded creature. They also looked at predator-prey ratios. Now this is the same thing where um, if you take a look at the African savanna and you have millions or you know, hundreds of thousands of wildebeest and hundreds of thousands of zebra and gazelle and you have these, these vast quantities of plant-eating animals and then you have a pride of lions, a cackle of hyenas, um, a pack of wild dogs, you have these very, very small groups of carnivores because it takes a lot of plant eaters, a lot of herbivores to support a small population of carnivores in a warm-blooded scenario because they're, they're burning up that energy, so they have to keep eating very quickly. Versus in, say, take a crocodile or a snake, a boa constrictor, and they chow down on something, and it may take them a long, long, long time to actually digest that food. So there can be more carnivores associated with fewer herbivores because a smaller population can support them. And they were noticing that about the dinosaurs, they're running into that same ratio that they were with warm-blooded animals. Kind of interesting. Raptor Red is one of my favorite books. It's an awesome book. All right, we have John Horner. Uh, before him, we didn't know how fast dinosaurs grew, and he's done, he did uh, a lot with a creature called Myasaura. He found or worked with a, a site over in Montana called Egg Mountain, where they found various sizes of one kind of creature, Myasaura, all the way from small, tiny, tiny hatchlings and embryonic all the way up to adult size. So then they were able to do histological slides, so bringing up that histology term again, and take slices and slabs of these bones to figure out how fast are they growing. Uh, he also, he, he enjoys stirring the pot. <laughs> he enjoys poking and, and getting people to think a little bit. Uh, so he brought out the, the idea of, well, what if Tyrannosaurus rex is just a scavenger and not a predator? Uh, I personally don't believe this, but it, it gets people riled up and it gets people thinking, which is a very good thing. He's, yes, he's currently trying to genetically engineer a chicken into a dinosaur, so the Chickenosaurus. Uh, that, that's the, the latest updates that I've seen. <laughs> and he was the paleo advisor for the Jurassic Park movies. So Alan Grant was kind of modeled after John Horner. Xu Xing. Um, before Xu Xing, Dinosaurs were considered, uh, yeah, they may have been warm-blooded or so, but they were still scaly reptiles. Um, they didn't have any furry coats or, or ornamentation or, or feathery structures. Um, and after him, 
well, he's still working right now, uh, as, as is Bacher and Horner and <laughs> they're, they're still alive. They're doing just fine. Uh, but but they're, uh, he's working, Xu Xing is currently working on feathered creatures. So looking at uh, creatures and, and how they're getting these feathers and what these feathers look like, um, uh, maybe even a little bit with, with feather coloration. So he's working on some more of the evolution of feathers. And so then he's also uh, naming and discovering many, many dinosaurs over in China as well. So really making these dinosaurs uh, an international thing. Not just a European thing, not just a North American thing. I mean, dinosaurs are global. They're everywhere. So we, we need to get more paleontologists across the globe. Karen Chin, also a personal hero of mine, um, she is the queen of Pooh. Uh, coprolites had been collected, but not really studied. And she is renowned for figuring out what kind of plants were alive at the time by even just looking at the tiniest pollen grains within that feces. Um, Beetles are using the poop as a food source, so that's something that we found in our Dickinson site as well. We'll, we'll come across little uh, beetle balls, we call them. And he also, she also discovered chipped bone pieces in the T-Rex. So maybe T-Rex was not being a nice, delicate eater, but maybe T-Rex was chomping down a little bit more on the food. So that's, that's how you're going to get bone chunks in there, would be if the, if the teeth are slamming down into that bone. So yeah, lots and lots of, of other people. We've got Hitchcock and Lighty is, is very well known for, for North Dakota. Um, Huxley and the Sternbergs, like all of the Sternbergs, Lawrence Lamb, uh, Gaylord Simpson. Uh, I'm not going to read through all of these right now. Uh, you, can, you can head back onto the YouTube video and kind of freeze frame in order to look up some of these people. Charles Knight really, really influenced a lot of the artwork, Henderson artwork, Greg Paul artwork, uh, just bringing in the paleo um, artists out there are sometimes pushing the boundaries for what we think is viable for science. And then it turns out maybe it's not so wrong. But so we have all of these people that are currently impacting paleo and maybe you will in the future too. So that was my brief, brief <laughs> uh, heroes of paleontology. And again, only just touching on the very tip of the iceberg as far as paleo is concerned. All right, Jeff and Clint, who are your favorite heroes? Oh, uh, you, you touched on, on some of mine. I think, uh, of course, Cuvier and, um, and, uh, Roy Shepard Andrews hit the top of the list for sure. For me. I'd like to note that one of your heroes dissected the other one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> this is true. And that person is, well, part of that person is currently in the collections at the London Museum. So, <clears throat> so just like, like Cope and Marsh, Gideon Mantell and uh, Richard Owen did not get along at all. They were kind of vying for a lot of the same positions and Richard Owen won out in most of those cases. Um, Gideon Mantell ends up being kind of destitute at the end. And he had a private museum that he was trying to get recognized by the British crown, because that's kind of how you got funding back in those days. Um, and then you would become the Royal Museum of whatever, once you were recognized. And he never managed to get his museum recognized. Um, whereas Owen went on to run the, the London Museum, which was the most prestigious uh, museum in England at that time, and probably still now. But um, so, Eventually, uh, Gideon Mantell uh, had a very bad carriage accident where he injured his spine. And it's actually really neat. If there, you can see drawings of it. When it rehealed, his spine ended up twisted. And so he could never walk right again. And he didn't survive too much after that. Um, maybe another, I think it's like six months or a year or something like that. But then after he passed away, um, because Richard Owen was running the London Museum and uh, had a big comparative anatomy uh, division that was modeled after what Cuvier had been doing in France. Um, he requested to have Gideon Mantel's skeleton so he could dissect it to look at what happened to those vertebrae. And that section of vertebrae was then added to the comparative collection in London. So I, I, like, I like Gideon Mantel. He's 
one of my favorites um, for a lot of the, the early plant eating dinosaurs he worked on and a lot of the stuff he, that he tried to push through, but he did not have a very uh, overall lucky life going through stuff. So I would like to add in as well that there were some, uh, there's two people in there uh, that both worked in Mongolia. Uh, the first was uh, Roy Chapman Andrews, who actually was a help to close off Mongolia to Western uh, paleontologists because he was, the Mongols found out he was selling the eggs that he found uh, at auctions to raise money to go look for more eggs. And they got very angry about that and shut down uh, Mongolia to any fossil interests. And it stayed closed until Zofia came back from, with the Polish expeditions uh, in the 1960s. Uh, and she was actually one of the first to go back into Mongolia after all of that was done. So uh, you mentioned Mongolia and both of them, but it's, you know, they're the bookends. You know, he closed it off, but she reopened it. So um, it was kind of cool. Uh, Zofia was actually part of the, also part of the expedition that discovered the, uh, the very famous fighting dinosaurs that is the uh, Velociraptor and Protoceratops that is on exhibit in Poland. Uh, from what I understand. So she was on that expedition that discovered those two fighting, the very famous fighting dinosaurs. So Sophia is, Sophia is a, definitely a hero. She's a, she was a tremendous lady. I, I, I never got to meet her, um, but I would have liked to very much. She was still in Poland and wasn't moving around um, when I would have had the chance uh, to meet her, but she would have been really a tremendous person to, to meet. From what I understand, she was, uh, she was a bit of a character and, didn't take a lot of nonsense. So she has um, just a couple years before she passed away, she published a wonderful book titled In Pursuit of Early Mammals, because that's actually a lot of the work that she did. She was on the expeditions and led a lot of the expeditions that found a lot of these Mongolian dinosaurs, but her research interests were largely focused around the early mammals that were around at that time. And so she has a wonderful book that talks about early mammal evolution, but then also has like the backstory of how those expeditions were put together and how they found things and just the timeline of like the short amount of time that they're there on the early trips. And it's like, and this day we found the first ever, you know, Pachycephalosaurian from Asia. And it's just this beautifully, absolutely complete skull that was sitting on a pinnacle, just waiting to be picked up. All they had to do was go over and pick it up. And they're like, Oh, look, the first, first Asian Pachycephalosaur. I wonder and what that's like. <laughs> there hasn't been another beautiful one like it since then. Um, and so just some great stuff like that, um, where you get to learn not just about early mammal evolution, which is really interesting, but then also the history of, of how these finds were made, um, and everything that they went through to make them happen. So, and but, still the, the institute that she worked in, uh, is, is, it's a major paleo academic center now, and she built that up. So as Becky was pointing out, there's a really, there's a lot of good books out there that focus on this for those of you that are interested in it. Um, the one that I read that I was very pleased with, uh, there was actually a couple. The first one is uh, Fossils in the Attic, and that's about some of the American museum expeditions. It's not just about paleo, it's about a lot of the things that are in the American museum collections. It deals with meteorites, it deals with fossils, a lot of that early stuff. That was a fun read. Um, the best one I read about the Cope Marsh Wars was called The Gilded Dinosaur, and that one was also very good. Uh, and then there's a couple about um, the Mongol expeditions by uh, Andrews that were very good as well. So there's a lot of really good um, information out there if you're interested in the history of paleontology as, as I am. I enjoy following the uh, the art side as well, just seeing how how between the artists and the and the paleontologists, just the the knowledge has changed, and and it's really cool looking like at the the first reconstructions of iguanodon with the uh, the thumb spike sticking off the nose, and then they become kangarooosaurs where they're upright but dragging their tails on the ground, and and then they're balanced on their hips, and it's just just seeing how all of that changes, and just looking at some of the old literatures is really cool. There's also a really good book for people that want a little deeper knowledge of what, what kind of world Cope and Marsh left us in immediately after they were done doing their work. 
Um, and it's called uh, The Second Jurassic Dinosaur Rush. It was written by a, a friend of mine, Paul Brinkman. Um, Paul was one of the preparators that worked on Sue the T-Rex specimen and then has done a lot of other work, um, also preparation-wise. But his major focus is history of science, and so he's a history um, scholar. And so he put a lot of the back information together about a lot of the expeditions that happened after Cope and Marsh were done in the early 20th century. And there's a lot of really important discoveries that are made and a lot of important steps towards building paleontology as we know it today um, and kind of correcting some of the problems that came about because of the Cope and Marsh feud. Um, there were some great discoveries that were made, but also there was a lot of bad blood. And so we had to fix a few things after that. So it's, it's not, Definitely not the first book you want to read on paleontology, but if you really um, get deep in and you want to know um, about some of the follow-up characters that also did really important work, that's a great book as well. Got a question here for how do people know um, what coprolites, or what, what do people basically think of what coprolites were before we thought they were poo? And I'm having a brain fart <laughs> over the actual previous term Bezoar stones, Bezoar stones. Um, that's right. Uh, was, we, we, we did a, a, a chat on, on that and mentioned that the Bezoar stones were, were these things. They, they thought they were these little objects that just kind of grow and, and crystallize within your body uh, and then they just don't digest. And so they, they would find them and think, oh, yeah, these look kind of like Bezoar stones. Um, so from, from living creatures. Except for they're not. <laughs> We'll, we'll just wrap up for right now, and you can join us again on Thursday at 10 a.m. Central. We'll be chatting, just the three of us, field stories, lab stories, collection stories. All right, so until Thursday.